What is up, people? Welcome back. In this episode, we'll take a deep dive into the market for money, and we might even draw a new model, so let's get it. And don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe while the music plays. Okay, so at this point in macro, you're a supply and demand champion. This lesson is all about the supply and demand of money. I love teaching this because it has such a strange feeling to it. Why do we demand money? Who supplies it? And perhaps most interestingly, what's the price of money? Then I tell you just how much a dollar cost. The price of happiness spot in heaven and bring I am God. Thankfully, economists don't believe it'll cost you a spot in heaven, but we'll get to our answer soon enough. Okay, to the model. All right, so the x-axis is the quantity of money and that's self-explanatory. Our y-axis is the nominal interest rate or the interest rate we interact with daily, the one that hasn't been adjusted for inflation. Remember from 4.2 that the nominal interest rate equals the real interest rate plus the expected inflation rate. Just a heads up about labeling this. On the AP exam, I strongly encourage you to write out all three words, nominal interest rate. But to be honest, most of the time if I'm drawing it, I'll just put a lowercase r and that works too. Next, we have our money supply and money demand curves. Depending on what textbook you or your teacher uses, there are different ways to label these curves, but I like to label them MS and MD. Okay, so the main thing that probably jumps out at you is that the money supply curve is vertical, showing that there's no relationship between the nominal interest rate and the quantity of money. The reason for this is because the central bank in the United States, it's the Federal Reserve, determines the monetary base, which in turn determines the money supply. We'll focus on the money supply in the next video, but now we're gonna laser in on the money demand curve. We can see that it's downward sloping, which is what we've come to expect from demand curves, and this one doesn't disappoint. But to understand why the MD curve is downward sloping, we have to start by answering the question, why do people demand money? I realize how absurd that sounds, but the answer is important to understanding this model. We demand money specifically to make it easier to buy stuff. This means that we typically don't want to hold all of our assets or wealth in the form of money, except to be able to buy stuff. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos don't have billions of dollars in money so they can Scrooge McDuck into their gold coins. Why not? Because money, and I'm using the narrow M1 definition of money, includes currency, demand deposits, and savings deposits, which earn very little to no interest. So for whatever amount of our assets we choose to hold as money, we're giving up the interest our wealth could be earning if it were held in interest-bearing investments like bonds or even just a savings account. Therefore, we hold only enough money to make it easy for us to buy stuff so that the rest of our wealth can earn interest. Or said another way, and this is really important so I'm doing my best to emphasize it, the opportunity cost of holding money is the interest we could have earned but are foregoing. The MD curve is downward sloping because as the nominal interest rate decreases, the opportunity cost of holding money also decreases, so we demand a larger quantity of money. Let's use some numbers that'll help illustrate this. Let's say you have $10,000 and you have to decide how much of that to hold as money and how much to put in an interest bearing account. Imagine how different this decision feels if the interest rate is 10% or if it's 0.1%. At a 10% interest rate, your $10,000 could earn $1,000 this year. But if the interest rate is 0.1%, that same $10,000 would only earn $10. So at a 10% interest rate, the opportunity cost of holding money is very high because of all of that sweet, sweet interest you'd be missing out on. But at a low interest rate, who really cares, you know? It's more convenient to hold money, and if you're barely giving up any interest to do so, it's not very costly. So one more time for the people in the back, the opportunity cost of holding money is the interest we could have earned, but are foregoing. Lastly, let's talk about shifts of the MD curve. My suggestion is to not memorize this list, but rather remember that we demand money so that we can buy stuff, because that really explains each of the shifters that we're going to identify. The first two are by far the most important, changes in the price level and real GDP. Let's not overcomplicate this. When the price level rises, aka when there's been inflation, stuff costs more. As a result, we now need more money to buy the same stuff as before, so our demand for money increases shifting the MD curve to the right, 
and leading to a higher nominal interest rate. Of course, if the price level were to fall and things were cheaper, we wouldn't need as much money to buy the same stuff, so our demand for money would decrease, shifting the MD curve to the left and reducing the nominal interest rate. The story is pretty similar with real GDP. Real GDP represents all goods being bought and sold, so when real GDP increases, it means that we're collectively buying more stuff, so we demand more money so that we can buy more stuff shifting the MD curve to the right. Some of you may have already made this connection, which is awesome, but if you think of the ADAS model, think about what happens when the AD curve shifts. It moves both P and Y in the same direction as the shift in AD. So we could also say that a change in AD affects the demand for money, since AD affects both the price level and real GDP. Be on the lookout for that on test questions. Next level stuff right there. And we could also look at banking policies that make it easier or tougher for us to get money. When it becomes easier to get money when we need it, we'll actually demand less money because it can earn interest until, you know, like five minutes before we need to actually make a major purchase. But when it's tougher to get our money, then we demand more money just in case. I'm from South Florida, and I can tell you that when there's a hurricane coming, one thing people do is they get cash because they're worried that when the power's out, they won't be able to access their money electronically anymore. So you know what you do? You get more money than you think you'll need, just in case. And if banks start offering interest on your checking account, this would also increase the demand for money, since now you've reduced the opportunity cost of holding money, since you can actually earn a little bit of interest on it. All right, so there's a lot there, but you've survived. Until next time, this has been a La Money Production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell, and check out the description for a link to get the answers to these practice questions as well as the unit notes and a great review book that I've made for you, and I will see you in the next video.